Think big. Live large. Because size matters. At least, when it comes to comic books. Oh sure, your standard floppy is all well and good, but the Treasury Edition showed us that we could be getting so much more. I'm Jason Mink, and this is Breakfast. The Marvel Treasury editions began in 1974. The treasuries are notable for their larger size of 10 inches by 14 inches. Also known as tabloid size, these big books were certain to catch a shopper's eye in a way that a regular comic could not. The dynamic presentation made these books ideal gifts, as well as giving longtime readers a new way to enjoy old favorites. The first was Spectacular Spider-Man number Number one from 1974. This volume reprints stories from The Amazing Spider-Man and starts off with a bang with issue number eight and the first appearance of the Green Goblin. The book also features issues 14, 42, and 90 of The Amazing Spider-Man, as well as the Spidey story from Marvel Super Heroes 14 and a few other choice bits and bobs. December of 1974 saw the release of The Fabulous Fantastic Four. This book was wall-to-wall -wall Lee and Kirby collaborations, reprinting FF6, 11, and 48 through 50, featuring the introductions of Galactus and the Silver Surfer. Kirby's art feels tailor-made for this format, his cosmic scenarios stretching to the edges of the oversized panels. If anything, the pages still aren't big enough. 1974 also saw the release of The Mighty Thor, which included stories from Journey into Mystery number 125 and Thor 126 through 30. Lucky readers of this book revisited the first appearance of Hercules and the pair's initial team-up against the dark forces of Pluto. More Kirby goodness here, which was a nice reintroduction to the King's work, prefiguring the creator's return to the company in the spring of 1975. The first Treasury edition of 1975 would feature Marvel's hot new star, Conan the Barbarian. This book reprinted Conan number 11 and the story Red Nails, which had appeared in black and white in the magazine Savage Tales, but was now offered for the first time in full color. Whether you dug Conan's adventures or just got off on the beautiful line work of artist Barry Windsor Smith, this one proved to be a must-have. Next up was Treasury Edition number 5 and the Hulk on the Rampage. This volume was more of a mixed bag due to the Hulk's sometimes erratic publishing and frequent creator turnover. Stories included are from Incredible Hulk number 3, Tales to Astonish number 79 and 100, Incredible Hulk number 139 and 141, along with a Hulk Thing Slugfest from Marvel Feature number 11. And dig this trippy Herb Trimpy back cover. Speaking of trippy, how about this nigh-hallucinatory image for issue number six featuring Doctor Strange, the most mystical hero of them all. Behind this eye-popping Frank Bruner cover lurk stories from Strange Tales number 111, 146, 148, and 157, along with Doctor Strange number 170, 177, and Marvel Premiere number 10. Witness the malefic menace of Dormammu, Shumagoroth, and original food court edgelord Nightmare. Treasury edition number 7 assembled some classic tales from the original Avengers, including issues 52, 57, 60, and 83. That's the introduction of the Grim Reaper, the first appearance of the Vision, not to mention the marriage of Yellow Jacket and the Wasp. And how about this Kirby back cover? Well, mostly Kirby. I think Vision's been reworked. So why is Hank Pym here twice? 
Only Jack knows for sure. Next up, Marvel decided to offer readers something a little different with the giant superhero holiday grab bag. While holiday-themed issues and comics were nothing new, this one was more of a hybrid with four holiday stories and one classic Marvel tale. While another Christmas story might have been nice, are you going to be the one to tell Hulk his story was dropped? <laughs> no deal. This was immediately followed by Giant Superhero Team-Up, which was another tasty mishmash of classics like Submariner 8, Daredevil 43, Journey into Mystery number 112, and Silver Surfer 14. Yeah, it seems like a fairly random assortment, but if you missed these tales the first time around, then this was a great way to read them and get them into the collection. At this point in our timeline, it's 1976, and Marvel decided to rein in the randomness a bit with Treasury Edition number 10, starring the Mighty Thor. Billed as a scintillating saga of gods, goddesses, and monsters, this reprints Thor number 154 through 157, which is one continuous Lee Kirby story. In a way, these treasury editions were the forerunners to today's trade paperbacks, collecting classic tales sequentially to make for a more complete read. 1976 also brought us another volume of The Fabulous Fantastic Four, featuring stories from FF4, 23, 51, and 94. And while it might seem hard to believe today, at one point the FF was Marvel's premier title. Okay, maybe Spider-Man sold better and folks were more interested in Conan, but the four still held a lot of cachet. This is their second treasury so far, and Daredevil hasn't had squat. Marvel Treasury Edition 12 gave readers more of what they wanted, which was, apparently, Howard the Duck. This feisty foul had recently taken comic done by Storm with his own title, and Marvel were eager to keep the ball rolling. This volume features a first for the Treasuries, a new story, guest starring the Defenders, and it's darn good. Even better, this reprints Hellcow, one of the oddest tales of Marvel's Bronze Age. 76 wrapped with the return of a Treasury concept, volume 2 of the giant superhero holiday grab bag. This time readers were grabbed in the bag by reprints of Marvel Team Up 6, Avengers 58, Tales to Astonish 93, and Daredevil 86, bracketed by a new framing sequence by Roger Stern, George Tusca, and Don Perlin. The first treasury out of the gate for 1977 was The Sensational Spider-Man. This was another example of Marvel reprinting consecutive issues in order to tell a complete story, this time from Amazing Spider-Man number 100 through 102. It's the first appearance of Morbius, along with the return of longtime foe, the Lizard. Oh yeah, and there's a Spidey story from Not Brand X thrown in for good measure. Conan was still in an upswing in 1977, so Marvel brought the Barbarian back for another go-round in Treasury Edition number 15, offering up reprints of Conan the Barbarian 24, Savage Tales 4, and Savage Sword of Conan issue 2. And I'd be remiss if I didn't show you this beautiful Frank Thorne pinup of Fred Sonia. No wonder these books are so often incomplete. The first Treasury edition of 1978 focused on Marvel's non-team, The Defenders. The book shone the spotlight on the gang's origin tale from Marvel feature number 1, as well as Defenders 4, 13, and 14. The Defenders were never hugely popular in my circle, but I suppose the inclusion of the Hulk kept the book vital enough for continued publication because Marvel knew what side their bread was buttered on, and they gave Greenskin his second solo treasury in 1978. This included such Hulk classics as issues 121, 134, 150, and 158. Thanks to the popularity of the Hulk TV show, Marvel could have just as easily printed a section of the yellow pages, and it probably would have sold. So great was the character's appeal. Heck. They could have called it the Green Pages and charged an extra 50 cents. Spider-Man was the first to get a third dip, with 1978's The Astonishing Spider-Man. The fact the wall crawler also had a popular TV show on the air at the time saw Marvel lean heavily into Webhead's direction. 
This one features some early stories from Marvel Team Up, including issues 4, 12, 15, and 31, including a great Cap Spidey one and done. And check out this brilliant cover by Bob Budinsky and Ernie Chan, featuring the heroes in the front and the baddies taking up the back. Things are starting to lock up a bit now as we get another Conan treasury with 19. It's notable that Conan has been to the well thrice, while long-established characters like the X-Men, Iron Man, or the Silver Surfer would never get the nod. Or how about an issue featuring Marvel monsters like Man-Thing, Werewolf by Night, or Ghost Rider? Seems like a winner, but if Marvel called to consult me, I guess I was out playing. 1979 brings the Hulkster back for his fourth go-round, and by now, some of the shine of the Treasury editions had begun to wear off. It's not that there's anything wrong with the stories, mind you, it's just that Marvel appeared to be cranking these books out with increasing speed and diminishing attention to any uniting theme. Buyers received reprints of Incredible Hulk number 136, 137, and 143 and 144. Treasury Edition 21 features the return of the Fantastic Four, this time focusing on a trio of stories by Stan Lee and John Buscema. For your two bucks, you get FF120 through 123, which sees the appearance of the Silver Surfer, Galactus, and Richard Nixon! Well, I'm sure it made sense at the time. These treasuries make for great time capsules, documenting moments that will never come again. Treasuries 22 through 24 are more Spidey, Conan, and the Hulk before Marvel decided to mix it up with Book 25, having Spider-Man and the Hulk team up for the Olympics, no less. Marvel came up with an original story taking place at the 1980 Lake Placid Winter Games. This one was written by Mark Renwald, Stephen Grant, and Bill Mantlo, with art by Herb Trimpey and Bruce Patterson. They took the bronze. 1980 ended on a familiar note with Spidey and the Hulk. Again, it's a shame as this large format would have made for an ideal home for reprints of the Avengers Kree Skrull War or issues of Lee and Buscema's Silver Surfer. The fact that fans were repeatedly bludgeoned over the head with the same characters only sped up the end of the tabloid format with 1981 seeing but a single treasury released. Perhaps determined to go out with a bang, this book gave readers another new story, no less than the second team-up between DC and Marvel. Superman and Spider-Man was a sequel to the character's first encounter, written by Jim Shooter with art by John Buscema and Joe Sinnott. So why didn't we cover Superman vs. Spider-Man already? Because technically, it wasn't part of the Marvel Treasury line. That said, when you mention Treasury Editions, this is one of the first that springs to most folks' minds, with Carmine Infantino's now unquestionably iconic cover art. Released in March of 1976, this book proved immensely popular with fans of both companies, as well as casual readers who just had to see how this one would play out. The sequel, while entertaining, was more of the same and lacked the impact of its unexpected predecessor. Now wait a minute, Mink, you may be saying. There were more of these. I own them. Well, my little friend, those are special. The Marvel Special Editions are often mistaken as regular treasuries, but they're special because Marvel said so. I don't know if they were trying to make it seem like they were putting out less of the same thing, or they had a grand idea for a bunch of different sublines, but these next books are set apart by this designation. Now, this is the book that hooked me on treasuries. I mean, that book is long gone, but at least I have a copy. You see, when this came out, I was actually still a kid, as hard as that might be to believe. I didn't own this comic, but an older boy down the street did, so I'd hang around him, hoping he'd let me read the damn thing. Back then, a fellow had to do some legwork to experience all the books he wanted. This volume featured Amazing Spider-Man number 6 and Annual number 1, and Dennis, I want to be buried with this. The next three specials focused on an obscure indie film from the 1970s you may have heard of. 
Star Wars and its sequel, Star Wars, reprinted the Marvel adaptation of the film in two parts, while 1978's Star Wars saw all six issues released in one mammoth tome. In the days before VHS tape and cable TV, this was pretty much the only way to get the widescreen fix. Here I am trying to replicate the theater experience with a handheld projector. Close, but no cigar. I remember finding my copy at Sears of all places, tucked amongst the coloring books, and I read the damn thing until it went to pieces. Attempting to catch lightning in a bottle once again, Marvel adapted Close Encounters of the Third Kind, to lesser success. Without the exotic locations, space battles, and robots of Star Wars, this fell a little flat compared to its predecessor. Marvel remedied this by rushing out more Star Wars in the form of their Empire Strikes Back adaptation, collecting issues 39 through 44 of Marvel's Star Wars monthly title. But wait, there's more. Let's not forget the treasury special of MGM's Marvelous Wizard of Oz from 1975, or its beautiful sequel, The Marvelous Land of Oz, with breathtaking Alfredo Alcala artwork. I found this in a big jumble sale for a buck and was thrilled to add it to the collection. I'm not super into the mythology of Oz, but I know beautiful art when I see it. Then there was the special collector's edition Savage Fists of Kung Fu, reprinting early classics from Deadly Hands of Kung Fu number 1 and 2, Deadly Hands of Kung Fu Special number 1, and Marvel Special Edition 15. Whew, that's a lot of minutia. And while there are a few more I don't have, let's wrap this episode with twin blasts of Kirby goodness in the form of Marvel's adaptation of the film 2001, A Space Odyssey, and Jack's own pet project Captain America's Bicentennial Battles. As I stated earlier, the larger format of the treasuries allowed the dynamics of Kirby's work to be enjoyed even more. Granted, by this point in the artist's career, Jack's style had grown a bit less detailed and more stylized, but the energy and flair is still present. The creator takes advantage of the larger format, as always, boldly moving forward into the medium's future. While both of these are terrific, Bicentennial Battles in particular has received new appreciation in recent years, being reprinted in tabloid size in 2021, if you missed it the first time. So there you have it. An apology to all of our DC Comics fans. Yes, the publisher did actually do their own splendid line of tabloids, but this video is already crazy long. If you want to see those, well, let me know in the comments section below. Treasury editions. Love them or hate them, they were a thing. And sometimes, that's all they need to be. I'm Jason Mink, and I'll see you next Sunday at breakfast.